About two years ago, I was featured in a New York Times article called Adventures of a Teenage Polyglot, which featured my passion for learning foreign languages, this peculiar hobby that I had. And at first I thought it was great. I love the fact that language learning was getting more attention. I love the fact that what had always seemed like an isolating hobby was suddenly putting me into contact with people all around the world. Yet as I spent more time in the media spotlight, the focus of my story began to shift. So whereas I'd always been interested in talking about the why and the how, why I was learning foreign languages, how I did it, instead it turned into a bit of a circus in which media uh, shows wanted to sensationalize my story. So it would go a little something like this. Hello, I'm here today with 17-year-old Timothy Donor, who is fluent in 20 languages. Oh, I I'm sorry, he actually can insult you in 25 languages and is fluent in another 10. Tim, uh, how about you tell our audience good morning and thank you for watching in Muslim? <laughs> uh, Arabic. Um, Ehlan bikum ya mushahidun wa shukran jazilan lil mushahida. Great, Tim. Now, can we get you to introduce yourself and say, uh, I'm fluent in 23 languages in German? Uh, it's, it's not really true, but no, 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 just tell the audience. Hallo, ich bin Tim Donner, ich bin 17 Jahre alt und ich kann ungefähr uh, 23 Sprachen fließen sprechen. Perfect. Now, how about a, uh, a tongue twister in Chinese? <laughs> well, we could talk about Chinese. You know, a, a lot more Americans are learning Chinese these days, and I think there's a lot of value in that. No, 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 just give us a tongue twister. <laughs> this guy. Uh, Tim, how about another tongue twister in Chinese? I would prefer not to, but, uh, you know, we could talk about China. You know, there's a lot that you can gain by learning a language. Oh, Tim, I'm sorry, that's all the time we have. <laughs> Now why don't you tell our audience goodbye in Turkish, and we'll be over here. You know, we haven't talked about anything substantive, but Turkish, please. Haydi bakalım. Tamam. Güle güle ve çok teşekkür ederim. How about that kid, right? Wonder if he gets any girls. <laughs> now, stay with us, because up next, a skateboarding bulldog in a bathing suit. <laughs> So, as funny as that was, it highlighted two pretty major problems in the way my story was covered. On a personal level, I felt that language learning was now becoming like a bit of a, a, a task, almost. It felt, it felt like something that was suddenly, had to be rigidly, uh, rigidly organized, something that had to be compartmentalized, rationalized, expressed in a concrete number. I speak X languages, I know Y languages, as opposed to what I'd always done, which was just learning languages for the fun of it learning to communicate with people, learning about foreign cultures. And on a bigger level, it cheapened what it meant to speak a language or to know a language. Now, if I can impart you with anything today at TEDx Teen, it's that knowing a language is a lot more than knowing a couple words out of a dictionary. It's a lot more than being able to ask someone where the bathroom is or telling them the time of day. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So for those of you who aren't familiar with my story, Maybe a lot of you here don't know what the word polyglot is, and it's a pretty weird one. I started here. So this little tot is me, circa 2001, and this is the beginning of my language learning journey. I actually was a child actor before I learned any languages. And I always had a little bit of a gift for accents. So I would go into auditions for radio commercials or for TV commercials, and I would do an Austin Powers impression. I'm not gonna do one now. <laughs> Or maybe I would do Apu from The Simpsons. Uh, in fact, there was actually one time in an audition in which I was asked to leave because they told me to speak like a little kid with a lisp and I wanted to do Darth Vader in a French accent. <laughs> but that taught me the basics of how to break down sound, how to pick up a foreign accent or foreign speech patterns and really live with it. Now, fast forward a little bit. I'm now in about third grade and I've just started French for the first time. But six months into it, a year into it, even two years later, I can't converse with anybody. French is just another subject in school, and even though I can tell you words for elbow, knee bone, shoelace, I couldn't really have a fluent conversation with anybody. Fast forward a little bit more. 
In seventh grade, I started Latin. So Latin, of course, is a dead language. And in learning Latin, you really learn how to break down language, to see language as a system with rules and as a bit of a puzzle. So that was great, but I still didn't feel like language was for me. So forward a little bit more. I'm about 13, and out of an interest in learning more about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I started studying Hebrew. Now, I had no way of doing it. I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. So I listened to a lot of rap music. I'd memorize lyrics, I'd spit them back out, and I would just try to chat with native speakers once a week, once a month. And I found that incrementally, I started to understand a lot more. Now, I didn't sound like a native speaker. I couldn't speak very articulately, and I certainly didn't know the grammar. But I had done what I had never managed to do in school, which was to pick up the basics of a language all on my own. Forward a little bit more. I started taking Arabic when I was 14 in a summer program going into ninth grade. This was summer of 2010. After a month, I found that I could read and write without a problem. I learned the basics of the formal language and one of its major dialects. And it turned me on to the fact that I really could pursue languages as a hobby. So it finally came to March 24th, 2011. So I have pretty vicious insomnia, and as I was studying more languages, uh, using grammar books or watching TV shows in, let's say, Arabic or Hebrew became one way of focusing my time. So on that night, while I was awake till some ungodly hour, I recorded myself speaking Arabic into my computer screen, subtitled it, and I uploaded it to YouTube under the title, Tim Speaks Arabic. Tim Next day I did the same thing, Tim Speaks Hebrew. And the comments, when they trickled in, were fantastic. I got things like, wow, I've never seen an American speak Arabic before. <laughs> Do you blame them? Um, in addition to that, I got things like, wow, maybe you should, you should fix your vowels here. Or maybe this word is pronounced this way. So suddenly, language learning had gone from the solitary pages of the book or my computer screen into the wide world. After that, I was hooked. I had a, a community of speakers to interact with, and I essentially had a teacher or conversational partners for any language that I wanted to do. So I'll show you a quick montage of that. I'm <laughs> That became my way of reaching out to the world. But as I was learning all these languages, I faced a number of obstacles. So number one, I had no idea how to teach myself. In fact, I'm sure many of you, if you were told you have to learn Pashto by next month, you wouldn't know what to do. So I experimented. Here's one thing. So in my Latin class, I read about something that Cicero described called method of loci. Technically, loquorum. But it's a technique in which you take mnemonics. So let's say you want to learn 10 vocab words on a list. You take each of those words, and instead of memorizing them in blocks, you integrate them into your spatial memory. So here's what I mean. This spot right here is Union Square. It's a place I go every day. If I close my eyes, I can imagine it very, very vividly. So I imagine myself walking down Union Square, and at each spot in my mind that has resonance, I associate it with a vocab word. I'll show you right now. I'm walking down Park Avenue, and in Japanese, to walk is iku. I go a little bit further, turn right, sit on the steps where I can suwaru. Directly north of there is a statue of George Washington, which I used to think was a fountain, so that's nomu, to drink. Right next to that is a tree that you can kiru, cut. If you want to go north to a Barnes & Noble, you can yomu, to read. Or if I'm hungry and I want to go to my favorite falafel place, I can go one block west of there so I can taberu, to eat. Did I miss one? All right, so eight out of 10. Not bad. So I found that most of the time, by experimenting with methods like these, it made language learning a much more interactive experience. It made it something that I could remember much better and I had a lot of fun with. Maybe that's not for you. Here's another one. So a lot of people often ask me, if you're studying so many languages at the same time, how do you not confuse them? Or how do you learn so many vocab words? In Spanish, I learn the word for table and then the word for book goes out the other ear. What I do is embrace those. So for example, Take these three words in Indonesian. These were actually among the first 50 words that I learned. Kapala, kabar, kantor. Lexically, they're unrelated to each other. Kapala is a head, 
Kabar is news, Kantor is an office. But they all sound similar, K-A, right? So what I would do is I would memorize vocab in batches of sounds that were similar. So if I hear the word kapala in Indonesian, I automatically think the words kabar and kantor. Same in Arabic, iqtisad, istiklal, sukut. Those three words are unrelated. One is economy, one is independence, one is downfall. But if I hear one, it triggers... <laughs> it triggers the rest. Same thing in Hebrew, chozel, zochel, zolech, even though those are return, remember, and to shine. Or in Farsi, uh, in which they are related. So for me, if I hear the word pedar, which means father, I automatically think of the words modar, marodar, dochtar, mother, brother, daughter. So again, this is one method, and I'm not saying this will make you fluent in a language, but it has been one of my ways of overcoming those obstacles. So you may be wondering, what's the point in doing this? Why learn Pashto or Ojibwe when you live in New York? And there's a point to that. In fact, I've lived in New York my entire life, and I'm always blown away by the number of languages you can hear on a given day. Walking down the street, I see billboards in Chinese or in Spanish. I see Russian bookstores, Indian restaurants, Turkish bathhouses. Yet for all that linguistic diversity, mainstream American culture remains decidedly monolingual. And if you don't think that's true, look at the reactions to Coca-Cola's Super Bowl video. So, as I started to play around more with language learning, I found that I had my own community of learners here in New York. I would go out to outer boroughs and, for lack of a better word, embarrass myself. I try to talk to people all day, get their views on things, and use my newfound language skills. How are you? Natan. Natan. Good day. How are you? I'm Tim. 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 Very nice. Very nice. Where are you? Now, I have written this book, but this book is the name of Kudadila Shah Khud Navist. Or Navis Navis Kya is right? Writer? Khud Navis Oh was was written. Uh about his own life. Oh okay. Oh Khud Navis. Khud Navis. Khud Navis. Khud Navis. Yes. So maybe you have to use a lot of English. Maybe you're not really that articulate or interesting when you talk, but the point is you're getting out there and you're getting exposure. So I don't speak Urdu that well, it's a kind of awkward conversation. But just from that, I have learned a new word, Khud Navisht. I'm not gonna forget it now. So moving on, you may wonder. Again, what's the point of doing this? And I try to explain to people a lot what my various motivations are, but I often feel that this quote from Nelson Mandela is the best expression of that. If you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. So as I've begun to see, there's an enormous connection between language and culture, language and thought. And quite honestly, if you want to learn Persian, for example. You pick up a dictionary and you say, I know how to say thank you, I know how to say how much is this, and I know how to say goodbye. Oh, I speak Persian. Probably not. Let's see, actually. In fact, if you want to buy something in a Persian bookstore, you might ask someone, how much is this? Generally, they'll tell you this. Which means... <laughs> so in fact, this is an ingrained cultural practice called ta'arof, in which two people having a conversation both try to behave more humble than the other. So if I go to buy a book, it's rude for that person to tell me it's five bucks. He has to say, it's worthless, please. You are so good looking, you're so talented, you're whatever. Take it for free, I'm so humble, take it for free. Or you might find something like this phrase. If you wanna thank somebody, if you wanna show your gratitude towards them or say nice to meet you, I could say, well, I know how to say thank you in Farsi, I speak Farsi. Maybe not though. In fact, I've often heard this phrase when I talk with Iranians, Orbanet Beram which literally means... <laughs> so again, it's poetic, you might call it melodramatic, but this is something you really have to understand the culture to get. All right, and again, I don't want to exoticize this because think about it, we have this in English all the time. If you ask somebody, how are you? What are you expecting to hear? I'm fine. If you tell me anything else, I'm not interested. But we do it anyway, we say, we say bless you even though that has no real religious connotation now when people sneeze, right? So, it's interesting if you think about the fact that most linguists believe language doesn't inherently affect the way you think, right? There's no language that'll make you a math genius. There's no language that'll make logic problems impossible to understand. But there's a real tie between language and culture. There's so much language can tell you about one culture's mindset. And in fact, on planet Earth, every two weeks, another language dies. No more people are speaking it. Because of war, because of famine, 
oftentimes just because of assimilation. Maybe it's easier for me not to speak my village language, but to speak Arabic, let's say. Or maybe I'm from a tribe in the Amazon, my habitat is cut down, and it just makes more sense for me to learn Portuguese and lose my culture. So think about that. Two months from today is April 1st. For many of you, that date may be stressful because you have a paper due or the rent is due. But for two groups of people around the world, for two cultures, that means the death of their language, the death of their mythology, their history, their folklore, their understanding of the world. Now again, you brushing up on your Spanish, going to Japanese class, is not going to stop language death. But what it does do is begin to open up your mind to the idea that language in its sense, in essence, represents a cultural worldview. And if I can impart you with anything today at TEDx Teen, it's this. You can translate words easily, but you can't quite translate meaning. Thank you.